Chapter 9. My Release from Borstal About six weeks before I was released from Borstal, I was given home leave, and the first thing I did was to meet up with some of the former friends we knew, both Michael and I. David King, Brian Collier, both of them took me out for the week, and we went to Berkhampstead to a dance during that week. It was there we saw Long John Baldry, who had a hit record at that time, Let Your Heart Aches Begin. The trouble was, he tried to sing it at the dance without his orchestra, just a tape recorder backing track. It was not very good at all. When I'd been released from Borstal, I felt very cocky and was not prepared to take any nonsense from anyone. On my first visit to the Queen's Head, lo and behold, Alan Dobb was there, and he was there with his girlfriend, Liz Brown, who had taken me to court over the illegitimate child. We greeted each other, and he realised, from the way I spoke, I'd just been released from Borstal, because every other sentence of mine was peppered with, you know what I mean, or, do you know what I mean? When we went to the toilet, he came out and referred to the incident of the paternity suite, and said he ought to hit me for it. But let's just keep things as they were, as he was now in a relationship with Liz Brown. It was at this time I went to the Crombie shop just off the Kingsford Square, and had a mohair suit made to measure. But, to my disappointment, it never fitted properly, despite many tries by the manager to have it altered to fit me. When Michael came out of prison, he decided we should go and visit this shop and deal with the manager, Terry. I'll talk about this later. When I was sent to the boss, I was assessed in terms of my intellectual abilities, so that I would be sent to the most suitable borstal. I wanted to train as a television engineer, but the education department deemed me not intelligent enough, as I was very poor at maths and English. My written skills were virtually illiterate. So, they sent me to a borstal to do electrical installations, which was a craft course not really needing too much intellectual abilities. On this note, I talk from experience, and now my qualifications that dyslexic people are very astute and can understand electronics, so don't be put off by those who think otherwise. I understood electronics, how circuits worked, even though I could not read or write properly. It was due to my mother's insistence and tenacity that she managed to get me on the course at Enfield, even though it was three months already too late. They thought I was not clever enough. I was very pleased that I proved her right and came top of the group, in everything I did, in terms of practical work and the City and Guilds examination, it also confirmed my belief that the government officials sucked. The first project I built on the course was a four-valve superhat medium-wave radio receiver. This worked great, and everyone in the group were impressed by my work. On this course, I met a West Indian student. In his thirties, he was a Seventh-day Adventist and he believed it was wrong to eat pork. He argued that we must keep the law of Moses in terms of eating certain foods, and the seventh-day Sabbath was a Saturday. He put to me an argument that although fruits are fruits, and a banana is not an orange, nor an apple a banana, but they're all fruits, so although days of the week are all the same kind, as they are all days, only one is the Sabbath. I understood his argument, and agreed with him, and at that weekend, in Aylesbury, I would put this matter to Mrs. Knight, who was a Christian, who worshipped on a Sunday, the first day of the week. She was unable to answer the argument. It didn't matter to me, as I didn't care about such things, but I felt my student colleague was more right in his approach and more reasonable. I learned later that the Old Testament Sabbath was only a shadow of the rest that we have in Christ. Every day to the Christian is the Sabbath. I decided then to visit my brother, who was now in Maidstone Prison, and I did this when I could. Whilst he was there, he met another inmate, a senior man from Cyprus, who told him some fantastic story which we both believed, and we had ideas of being involved in gold smuggling. Michael was fed up with prison and wanted to escape, so this opportunity to leave the country and smuggle gold was his opportunity. Michael was due out on home leave, and instead of going back to prison voluntarily, he absconded. 
The Cypriot was offering us the opportunity to make money by smuggling gold. The idea was that we were to pair up with a Cyprus girl and pretend to be newly wed, then return to the UK on honeymoon. We would both be carrying gold strapped to our bodies. There were no metal detectors in those days or scanners, as at the airports are these days. We would have a suitable partner and we would carry the gold strapped under our clothes, making out we were new newlyweds. This would reduce the chance of being stopped by customs and so get the gold through. We were prepared to take this risk. It sounded exciting and that was what we wanted to do. The plan was that when my brother came out on home leave, we would go to Greece. We had a contact in London, all set up by the Greek man, and to take it from there. We were all hyped up, but there was no such person or arrangements, and we felt really let down. The gold smuggling came to nothing, so Michael was on the run from the law for a year. However, Michael decided he could not face going back to prison, so he just didn't return. He changed his name to Kenny, Kenny Tyndale, and managed to stay away from the police for a whole year before being picked up whilst working on a building site in Aylesbury. Michael's new identity enabled him to live and work and take up normal life in Aylesbury, and he did, and by now he had a steady girlfriend, which really helped to keep him on the straight and narrow. However, one night, whilst he was in the Crown pub in Aylesbury, with his girlfriend, Paddy Dunn, the local CRD, suspected he had identified the escaped convict. To verify his suspicion, he called out, Hey, Mick! Michael! But Michael, realised what was happening, ignored the salutation. Paddy then walked up to Michael and said, Hi, Michael! Michael simply turned around and said, No, I'm David. I'm not my brother. This worked, and Michael continued his life of freedom for a whole 14 months, living, working and keeping out of trouble with the police. You see, a girlfriend did the trick. At this time, I was doing a government training course at Enfield, and Michael got some work with a shop fitting company and worked in London. He decided he would live above the shop, which was in King's Cross, where they worked, and so I was able to visit him during the week. For a bit of fun, one morning we decided to go to the calf down the road, dressed in our pyjamas and a dressing gown. Bringing with us our own cornflakes, we went into the shop and asked for breakfast bowls and milk and sugar. This seemed a funny thing to do, and all went down well. Michael soon got fed up of being there on his own, so we decided he was leaving. So one night we stole the company's tools and equipment and returned to Aylesbury, where our parents lived. During this time, I renewed friendship with Pat Jones, and we did many things together. My brother had a girlfriend now, and I was seeking to have a good time. On one occasion, I showed Pat Jones the powerful effects of chloroform and knocked him out, so he was unconscious. Now, moved with my strange sense of humour, I cut several chunks of hair out of his head, and when he came to, he had no idea what I'd done. I found it great fun when I took him home and saw his mother's face. Of course, he had no idea what she was upset about. I just left and got out of the way, laughing to myself. It was after this that Pat Jones got his first skinhead haircut in Aylesbury. No one would normally cut all their hair off. It just was not fashionable. He did it, and I was proud of him. I'm sure he set the trend of the skinhead fashion in Aylesbury. One bank holiday weekend in 1969, when I was working at Radio Rentals in Hemel Hempstead, Pat Jones and I decided to go to Yarma for meet with the Aylesbury Mods and other skinheads. I took the Ferns van, in which we would sleep the night. On this occasion, this particular weekend, I was sleeping in the back of the Ford van on a Sunday afternoon, and Pat Jones was out with some of the lads, and they had a run-in with a crowd of greasers. Greasers were motorbike boys who would fight with knives and bicycle chains. It was very similar to the mods and rockers you see in the Who film Quadrophenia. They were the sworn enemies of the skinheads. This company of greasers had come across Pat Jones and his crowd and when they were on the seafront at Yarmouth and they were combing the area for skinheads to pick a fight with. There were too many of them and Pat Jones and the other crowd was on the run and I was happily asleep in the back of the van quite safe. Or would have been had it not been for Pat Jones running up to the van shouting and screaming, Get out! Come and run! 
or do something. He ran off, just having called attention to the greasers that I was there in the van. As I looked up and came to and looked out the van window, I could see a crowd of greasers grinning and running towards the van. They knew they now had a victim in the van. I was concerned it was the firm's van, so I had to get away. There wasn't much I could do, so I locked the doors quickly and jumped in the driver's seat hoping to drive. Unfortunately, I was awkwardly parked. As I tried to start the engine, a great whack came on the roof of the van. The van was hit with a number of times with bicycle chains, and heard shouts of glee. Then they began to rock the van, seeking to turn it over. They lifted it and rocked it as I tried to drive away. I must have hit one or two as I managed to get away in time from a beating. That was all thanks to Pat Jones. This, however, was all part of the fun getting into scrapes of one kind or another. On the way home that weekend, we decided to tow a four-wheel seaside bicycle back to Aylesbury, so I got Pat Jones to ride the bike, whilst we towed the bike all the way from Yarmouth to the outskirts of Norwich, before deciding to leave it outside a pub, as I began to realise we could be captured by the police going through London. It was all good fun, and it all made us laugh. It was in the summer of 1968, shortly after my brother had been released from prison, and I had served time in Borstal, we decided to go on holiday. Michael had become friendly with a girl called Karen Mead, but this did not stop our plans. We were going off with no plans to return. Michael had a nice long wheelbase Bedford van. It was fitted out with our equipment to live in. We fitted it with a double mattress on the roof with a tarpaulin-like tent. This was to be our sleeping arrangement. It was decided we would make our way to Newquay in Cornwall, and I remember going there with my parents when I was 16 years old. That year the sun was hot, the surfing was good, and a really nice summer. We were off to seek the sun. I had been to Newquay before, and I told Michael all about it. It was a place to go for surfing, to seek the sun. The Beatles had been there before us, stayed at the Atlantic Hotel, and were filming their notable film, Magical Mystery Tour. They booked into the Atlantic Hotel in Newquay on Tuesday, the 12th of September 1967, and left on Friday the 15th. Newquay was a famous place to go for a holiday, but at first, mischief was what we were up to. Our first mischief that we planned, but failed to do, was stealing a speedboat moored in the water of Barnstable. That evening we had planned to swim out to the boat and cut its mooring and float it down the river and load it onto a trailer. That afternoon we borrowed tools from a workshop, got some welding done to make a tow bar for the van. We needed a tow hitch to drive away with the stolen speedboat and trailer that night. All went to plan, until that night when we got the trailer ready, but when we looked at the cold dark water, it being pitch black, we both lost our bottle and decided to call it off. We left Barnstable disappointed. Our first bit of work was to work at the Gold Rock Hotel in Newquay. I was a waiter. My brother was a kitchen porter. I'd never been a waiter before, but soon picked it up. We were given sleeping quarters, but we soon realised this kind of work and life was not what we wanted. The hours were unsociable, so the next morning we decided not to go to work. We just stayed in bed. We made a huge joke of it and expected to get the sack. Sure enough, we were knocked up, and when it was realised we were late, but still we did not surface. When we decided to get up, we went to the chef, believing we'd got the sack, and so to collect our pay. To my surprise, they hadn't sacked us, just thought we'd had too much to drink the night before, and were prepared to overlook our sleeping. I said no, we would leave, and we were each given a pound each that we had earned for the day's work. In our mischief, we went back to the sleeping quarters the next day, where the girls were sleeping, and jumped into bed with the two girls. They didn't really want this, and made a bit of a protest. But before we left, the manager's wife had been informed and came to see what was happening. As she came into the bedroom, we were seen in bed with Angela, the chambermaid. The manageress screamed, Oh, Angela, how could you? The girl got the sack and I felt really bad about that afterwards. Shortly after this, we decided to rob a petrol station to get some money. My brother tried to disguise himself, wearing a long girl's wig, 
but this made him stand out even more, because he was flat-chested and had no hips like a woman, and this attracted attention rather than do the opposite. That idea was discarded, so I decided I would take the money. When the attendant was looking after a motorist, I crept up to the till and took the note and ran away behind some building, then quickly emerged, dressed in an old overall coat, and walked away slowly without being noticed. In the end, I noticed my brother writing to his girlfriend, and somehow we decided to return home to Aylesbury. After this I began to spend time with Pat Jones, as my brother got more involved with his girlfriend. Pat and Jones and I got into all kinds of things, which I will mention later. I was twenty years old, and he was just sixteen, so he began to learn many things from me, all of which was probably bad for him. It was after this I managed to get a job with Radio Rentals at Hemel Hempstead. This was a good job, and at twenty years old I was the only colour TV engineer in Hemel Hempstead branch, and with a company car. Michael was in love with his girlfriend, but she was just sixteen years old, but her parents would not agree that he and her should get married, because he'd been in prison. Not that they knew that, as he had changed his identity and name to Kenny Tyndale. However, Michael and Karen left for Gretna Green, and planned to marry as soon as they could. This was because you could legally marry at the age of sixteen without parents' consent. However, Karen got cold feet and ran away, and their relationship ended after that event. Michael then sold his house at Brackley, moved to Spain, and lived a life in the sun on his bobcat catamaran. This eventually got damaged in a hurricane in 1974. I spent the summer holiday there helping him repair the ship in Denia Harbour. After this time, Ken Knight wanted to go sailing in Brighton, so I agreed to go on the sailing trip to Shoreham. This weekend, we went sailing with Ken and Grace Knight. I took with me Mary Bilton, a girlfriend of mine, Bernie Gilbert, Alison Knight and Pat Jones. Whilst we were there, Mrs Knight went off to stay with a Christian friend in Brighton. Not that I knew that, and at that time I just thought she didn't like sailing, and it was a Sunday. However, she wanted to go to church. The friend of Mrs Knight invited us back to his home. He was called Tom and was the manager of the insurance company of Brighton. That afternoon he sat and talked to us about the Bible. I was almost convinced by his talk and began to believe there was more in the Bible message than I had ever liked to admit before. He told us about the history of the Jews and all future events and the return of the Jews to the land of Israel in 1967 was a clear sign of the last days. I had learned since then that such prophecies have already been fulfilled. I was very impressed by all this, so much so that I began to tell my friends at college the very next day all about it. This made me read parts of Deuteronomy about the curses that would come upon the Jews if they forsook the law of Moses and reject Jesus Christ. At this time Pat Jones was on his final year at school, and he informed me of a bully who relentlessly gave him grief at school. The school was the Grange Secondary Modern School, the school I had attended in June 1966. One day, at the evening youth club at the school, I decided we would sort out this buddy, so I instructed Pat Bones what to do. I was dressed in my long crumbie overcoat, which my mum had altered for me, and inside I kept a large, long rubber torch, which was ideal to use as a cosh, not too hard to break the skull, not too soft to do no harm, just about right to knock someone on the head and possibly knock them out. This was the plan. We were to go to the youth club and search out this bully. The Grange Youth Club was held behind the school buildings in some prefabricated buildings. It was early evening and not too dark, and a few people were around, and we looked out for the bully. I gave Pat Jones the large, heavy rubber torch and said to him, Now, when you see the bully... You must call out to him, Come here, and walk towards him. When he came right up close, he was to shout at him the words, I've had enough of you and your nonsense, and if you don't watch out, I'm going to set Dave Clark onto you. He was then to point in a direction away from him, so as to make the bully turn around and look over his shoulder. Look over there! And when he turned round, he was to hit him on the head as hard as he could with the torch. 
then say, now I'm going to do it again and roar at him. The plan went perfectly. He saw the bully dressed in his denim jacket. He had slight ginger hair, and I'm sure his nickname was Ginger. And I had never met him before. Pat Jones shouted out to him, and sure enough the bully came walking like a gorilla, swinging his arms, almost running to Pat Jones, eager to get him. I was happy, because this was where he was going to get the treatment. Pat did exactly as instructed. He said, look over there. And as he turned around, Pat walloped this bully hard on the head. Every eye was on the two in conflict. The bully was stunned, and his hands went up to his head to hold it, as it hurt. Then Pat Jones shouted to him, saying he was going to give it to him again, and sure enough, the bully ran away, as predicted. I encouraged Pat to chase after him, and make sure he knew his place. Everyone looking on looked on in amazement. From that day forward, Pat Jones had no more trouble from the bully. I felt quite satisfied in dealing with him this way. How would Jesus have dealt with this bully today? This is a real problem to parents in a world of violence, like today. I was not a Christian then, but this remedy actually worked in Pat Jones's case.